Okay, I think I think we may begin. This is a good moment to start. Hi everyone. So thank you all for coming out tonight or this afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from. DWG is really pleased to be hosting a space for Palestinian voices at a time where exposure and education is essential for revealing the origin of sign. To those that are attending one of our events for the first time, DWG is the diversity working group at Carleton University School of Architecture, where a student-led group formed to hold our faculty and architect school accountable for creating a more equitable learning environment and supporting our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. In previous lectures DWG has hosted, we've explored the themes and impacts of colonization and abolition in a wider context. But today we highlight Palestine, as the abuse and impact of colonization is universal and must be dismantled wherever encountered. As the title of today's lecture implies, this webinar is an academic event and discussion that will focus on the Palestinian narrative of ongoing events to hear and to understand the daily struggle with the imposed colonial projects. On behalf of DWG, we ask that you do not engage in any sort of prejudicial, Islamophobic, or anti-Semitic discourse throughout the lecture, as it undermines the Palestinian struggle and distracts from the fact that current colonial practices are violating the human rights of people native to the land, the Palestinians. We hope that you will respect these conditions and join us in earnestly listening to and learning from our lovely speakers and their unique, unique perspe perspectives. As Angela mentioned, um, please note that this lecture will be recorded and shared on our website. So if you're not comfortable being recorded, you do not have to turn on your camera. And so we're so pleased to introduce the moderator and driving force behind tonight's lecture, Rana Abu Ghanam. Rana is a PhD candidate and instructor at Carleton University School of Architecture and Urbanism, teaching both undergraduate courses and graduate studios that revolve around architectural design, urbanism, and spatial formations within colonial and post-colonial settings. Rana has also taught at the School of Architecture and Interior Design at the Canadian University Dubai and at the Department of Architecture at Berzate University in Palestine. Her research interests involved revolve around architecture and urbanity, the socio-political conditions which govern them. Her PhD dissertation builds on her previous research and focuses on spatial forms of colonialism and resistance in Hebron, Palestine. Her research publications about urban morphology concerning technological, socio-economic, demographic, and political concepts provide a, bril a brilliant and incredibly valued perspective to interdisciplinary discussions on race, social justice, and their spatial implications within the context of our school's expanding pedagogy. Rana is a devoted instructor and a passionate advocate for positive and equitable change in our school community. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to her to introduce our lovely guest speakers and get the discussion started. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you really for the DWG for helping to organize this event, uh, which really took form quite quickly. I would also like to thank our speakers for today, Sandy, Alessandro, and Abed, for joining us today in an event that was really conceptualized only about a week ago. It is really an honor having them join us today. I'd also like to thank all of you today who are attending and those who shared the event on different forms of social media. I'd like to start today uh, by really thinking about uh, where we are and how we organize. So as we organize today around topics of decolonization and resistance, I would like to begin with an acknowledgement to those who came before us in this struggle here in Churchill Island, back home in Palestine and everywhere else where oppressed, marginalized and colonized communities continue to seek freedom, justice and sovereignty. I would like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Rana Abu Ghanam, and I'm a first generation settler of color who immigrated to Canada from colonized Palestine a couple of years after the second intifada erupted in Palestine. I'm currently speaking to you from Ottawa city, which is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin nation. I wanted to use this acknowledgement as an intentional 
and thoughtful way to position myself and to provide meaningful and genuine acknowledgement to the First Nations and Métis communities whose land we occupy. We must recognize the ways in which our presence on this land upholds colonialism and reproduces disposition and violence for Indigenous people. In the last month, the Israeli colonial violence against Palestine across historic Palestine has really escalated. From the forced displacement and ethnic cleansing of Sheikh Jarrah, a case similar to many others in occupied Palestine, to the attacks by the Israeli Defense Force and settlers on worshippers and those celebrating Ramadan in Jerusalem, and to the aggressive and undeni undeniably unproportionate airstrikes on Gaza. These are just glimpses of the day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year realities that Palestinians have had to face. As the world celebrates the ceasefire in Gaza, we must remember that while the airstrikes might have subsided for now, the violence, the land grab, the apartheid, and the ethnic cleansing continues. But as the violence continues, so does the resistance. In, historic, in a historic moment, Palestinians in historic Palestine and diaspora have all come together to voice their condemnation against Israel's continued disregard to Palestinian rights. On May 18, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in historic Palestine went on a strike for the day protesting the Israeli colonial project. Around the world, Palestinians went, on, uh, went to the streets to protest and bring awareness to what is happening back home. Social, med social media, as many have, of you have noticed, has been flooded with material that advocates for Palestinian rights. Moments such as those are only examples of the many resistance and decolonial tactics that Palestinians have adopted to counter the colonial powers. We know and have seen firsthand the colonial structures um, and how they, in Palestine and across the world, have caused immense physical and intangible strife, anguish, and loss to those colonized. Resistance and decolonization to, the, to such systems needs to manifest in as well tangible mediums. For every action in nature, there is and needs to be an equal and opposite reaction. I believe that Tuck and Yang summarized this issue at hand beautifully when they said, decolonization is not a metaphor. Architecture and urban planning are as much apparatuses for the colonial powers to control and subjugate human bodies as they are tools that may cultivate resistance and decolonization. Recently, academics have become much more aware of the injustice distilled in our built environment, whether it being social, political, gender, or race-based, and which has led to a growing interest in architecture schools to tackle these problems. This is a welcome trend that needs to be embraced and treated through serious, thoughtful, and critical work. I'm very happy to see that the diversity working group at the School of Architecture has taken the challenge to deal with such questions. And I hope that our event today will take the conversation further into understanding decolonization and resistance from a Palestinian perspective. Discussions on Palestine frequently address questions of how the land is controlled by the colonial powers in a critique of the Israeli political urban strategies. Our event today, however, aims to look beyond those critiques and to investigate the Palestinian social narrative in changing urban spaces through resistance and decolonization. I'm very happy that our speakers today will address such topics, opening for us the possibility to see resistance and decolonization generally and Palestine specifically in a different light. So with that, I would like to introduce our speakers for the day. We first have Sandy, Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petty, uh, from DAR, Decolonizing Art Architecture Research. Both of them are architects and researchers in urbanism and they're founding members and co-directors of DAR. DAR is an architectural office and an artistic residency program that combines conceptual speculation and architectural interventions. In 2012, they founded as well Camps and Campus, or sorry, Campus and Camps, an experimental educational program hosted in the Haitian refugee camp in Bethlehem, Palestine. One of their latest, latest publications, Permanent Temporariness, which was published by the Art and Theory Publishing, is a book, a catalog, and an archive that accounts for 15 years of research, experimentation, and creation against and within the conditions of permanent temporariness. Their latest work, which is titled On Stateless Heritage, is currently on display at the Venice, at the Venice Beniale. Accompanying the art installation is a book nomination dossier titled Refugee Heritage that really attempts to deactivate the claims of obje objectivity that are presented by UNESCO's World Heritage designation. Sandy Hilal specifically is a Palestinian architect and a researcher. She's currently 
and she recently initiated the living room project or the Madafir project, which delves into separating the role of the guest and a host uh, through creating a series of spaces in terms of hospitality. Along to her, to her artistic practice, she's also headed the infrastructure and camp improvement pro program in the West Bank at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, which is the UNRWA project from 2008 till 2014. Alessandro, on the other hand, is a professor of architecture and social justice at the Royal Institute of Arts in Stockholm. He has also previously taught at the Honors College at Al-Quds Guard University in Abu Dhabi, Jerusalem. And he has written on the emerging social orders dictated by the paradigms of security and control in archipelagos and enclaves. Our second presentation will, today will be by Abed Abdurrahman Kittane. Abdel Rahman Kittane is an assistant professor at the Department of Architectural Engineering at Birzeit University in Palestine. In 2020, he obtained his PhD in Engineering Sciences from KU Levan in Belgium, with research on urban resilience and civilian resistance in the Kasabe of Nablus uh, during the Second Intifada. He is also a co-founder of the Yalla Project, which is a multifaceted initiative based in Nablus, Palestine, which is dictated to, or dedicated to create an environment that is in the interdisciplinary research of the regeneration of city shaping. His research, research interests are in the field of city, war, urban resilience, architectural and urban development, and architectural, and history, architectural history and theory. For today's event, we will begin with Dar and Sandy and Alessandro with a 15 minute uh, discussion on the concept of decolonization for them and how the, the formation of Dar uh, came together. Um, and I would be interested to kind of discuss as well their notion of decolonization as an ongoing project. We will then be followed by a presentation uh, from Abed that will be 15 minutes that discusses his PhD research on resistant movements in Nablus. We'll take about then 50, 25 minutes to discuss some questions um, on the notions of decolonization and resistance and how those manifest in their work. And then finally, we'll finish by opening up the space for the audience to ask any questions. If you'd like to join the conversation and ask any question, please feel, feel free to type the questions in the chat box or to raise your hand so you, that you may be called upon to ask your question. We hope that you enjoy today's event. And if you have any comments, please feel, feel free put, to put those in the chat box as well. So let's start off with Alessandro and Sandy. Uh, Alessandro and Sandy, I'm curious to talk to you about um, your work in Dar and how the, the project as a whole kind of was conceptualized and what's the concept for, of decolonization for you? Well, thank you, Rana. Thank you, everybody, for uh, hosting us. We are very happy uh, to be among you, and we are very happy also to be able to uh, think together in, in these moments where uh, things are shifting around us very quickly. And, and in many ways, I have to say that, um, strangely enough, even if it is scary and sad what is happening in Palestine, but it still gives a lot of optimism for the first time we believe that, you know, if the colonial project was about separating us, separating us from other people that are oppressed or separating Palestinians themselves among uh, themselves, finally we are seeing an, an, a resistance into no, we don't, we are not accepting this separation, we are united and we are united as Palestinians. Palestinians among all geographies, but we are re reunited also among all people that believes and all people that have been part of the struggle against oppression as, as part of to say no to what's happening against colonialism, right? So I, I think that it's also not only a, a sad and scary moment, but it's a moment of optimism where we feel that we have a huge tasks as people were each one within his own field to try to contribute as much as possible because it is a momentum and, and we need all to find ways to feed in and, and be able to understand how uh, we contribute and, and more peculiar, we will contribute in different ways, more effective our uh, struggle will be. And therefore, obviously we will uh, very much speaking from architecture point of view and I would like very quickly, before even saying how DAR uh, was initiated or established, 
I want to speak about a moment in 2003, which was maybe the first time that me and Alessandro did the first project together, where we were asked to think about how we represent Palestine in a place like Venice Biennale, right? And Venice Biennale is made of nation states that are represented. And what we proposed at that time, we refused as architects to propose any uh, building or any object, rather than we decided to speak about the non-representation of many people in the world, right? The, the Biennale is a Eurocentric, and we decided instead of getting the Palestinian small victory, we scattered uh, all kinds of, of documents that Palestinians hold in their hands as a way to show statelessness and the absence of any form of representation for stateless people in venues like Venice Biennale and elsewhere. And at that moment, still in 2003, I have to say that mainly our uh, practice was speaking to the West, was trying to show what is happening, was trying to say this is what is happening. And as if we were still believing that if the machine, if the colonial machine or if if the West would understand what is happening, this might stop. And in, indeed, it, it felt that as if we were speaking to only a certain kind of audience. In 2006, when our first daughter uh, born, we decided to go and live in Palestine. And for many reasons that I would not speak about right now, if you are interested, you can find it out. We spoke about it different times in, in literature, in the book we uh, wrote about it. And, and we decided to go back to Palestine. And, and actually our practice shift radically. Dars mean in Arabic home. And we felt that our um, understanding of architecture was about what does it mean for a couple like ours that we are both Palestinian and Italian. And I was at that moment in 2006 holding the Italian passport and we were able to live in Europe if we wanted. So it was a choice. Ours was completely a choice to come back and live in Palestine and create our own practice because we feel that it's from there where we can begin to understand what does it mean for architects to engage directly with decolonization and how can we understand our practice uh, from that point of view and we immediately faced the fact that you know in Palestine there was uh, a lack of public discourse around what does it mean uh, architecture and decolonization right we, we were almost alone and there was no uh, public debate about this and indeed the only place we had to create that public debate was our domesticity was our house right and this is why we created dar and in our house we had a, a huge terrace where it became the place for uh, conferences conversations uh lectures sometimes uh, I mean, it, we, we, we turn it into, and, and later on, we even turn it into residency where, where we were hosting uh, many people. And indeed, it became the point of reference through which we began to do many projects around what does it mean decolonization for us. But definitely, maybe one very important point is that we never saw uh, territoriality as the only way to uh, uh, act. And I will explain what I mean by that. You know, I have all the time suffered the fact that, you know, Palestinians should resolve their Palestinian colonialism. Uh, others, each, each one of us as, as an oppressed should think uh, about his own way of struggling. And not only that we were excluding many people that were actually not feeling, I mean, that comes from a colonial background, but is willing to begin to decolonize colonize himself or herself as a way of being part of the struggle. So Dar was a very much a place where it is about a collective thinking. What does it mean today for us to think decolonization in architecture, the moment that we were all trained 
in faculties of architecture where we learned about modern architecture as only progressive, as only a way forward. And then you will realize going back to Palestine that modern architecture is one of the ways that colonizers actually managed to whitewash constantly their way of going and colonizing the world. And they were going to colonize the world by saying, we are here to civilize you, to modernize you, to bring you modern architecture. So we were faced with the fact that there is no way to speak about decolonization and architecture without speaking about mod modern architecture and without demodernizing modern architecture as the first step for us as architects to understand how we engage with the struggle for decolonization. I think this is a little bit, I, I will pass also now to uh, Alessandro, there is no I mean, I would like not to speak about specific projects because they are there and you can consult with them. I would like to use this moment as a moment more of reflection of how can we think today decolonization as, as architects and then maybe we will follow up. But as having only 15 minutes, uh, I would pass to Alessandro and then hopefully continue. Um, yeah, maybe I can just try to add to what Sandy said try to um, you know restate maybe what Osorana was was proposing as a question you know I mean the question is what does it mean to decolonize and in order to answer this question I think each one of us of course has to position herself and himself in a specific context I think of course one of the danger especially in the recent years and especially in academia that we are there one of the danger would be that this become another kind of um, you know, concept that becomes fashionable in a period of time and then disappear. I think we have to say, especially as in our case, we have been working since more than 15 years. And I think before us, of course, there are so many different struggle and decolonization, of course, also refer to specific historical struggles that happened, especially during the Second World War, where different nations were directly involved in um, getting rid of direct colonial European um, control on their land. So what is also very important maybe when we try to articulate and, and try maybe to find a, a meaning to the word of decolonization also uh, referring to our uh, individual and collective history. So the way that we engaged uh, since we established uh, DAR in Palestine decolonization essentially meant getting rid of the Israel colonizations, occupations and apartheid system. Um, that of course, in, as an architect means also understanding more precisely how architecture of course was used as main tool of colonizations of Palestine and how urban planning of course was used as a way to, to segregate and how uh, you know, modernizations and modernity was actually used as an ideology to, uh, to divide and segregate um, uh, different territories. Um, therefore, for us, from the very beginning, uh, we engage more specifically an understanding of uh, decolonizing architecture that we're really looking at the uh, materially built space. So we were really looking in that specific cases, we started looking at um, uh, and imagining how to reuse um, uh, Israeli colonial architecture and the moment that would be evacuated. So we produce a sort of scenario thinking about, you know, as we uh, already get rid of that, and that actually is also the revolutionary power of decolonization with, is able to also imagine a different reality that we live in, and that specific case was reimagining, you know, how Palestina would reuse Israeli colonies, and what are the limits, and what are the, um, you know, the possibility to re to reuse. And some of these projects you will see also on our website, which is decolonizing.ps. I will, as Andy said, mention. I will not talk specifically about those projects, but these were a set of different projects that were addressing specifically uh, this Israeli uh, architecture of occupations in settlements, but also in military bases. So, and these were all, in a sense, also very uh, at, the, at the level of, of speculations. But also we have learned historically how decolonization also meant different things in different contexts. And also where are the challenge, especially in relation to 
uh, to architecture. So these questions, for example, were always brought, you know, in the moment that um, colonial, uh, uh, colonial power was uh, unplugged from the situations, of course, the question was how to reuse those architecture. And of course, some people thought that the best way was actually to demolish them, you know, to just get rid completely of the colonial architecture. And in some cases, maybe, you know, as also Fanon was arguing, maybe it is the right choice. You know, there is no way that you can actually deal with that architecture. But however, we also know that in different situations, uh, this was not necessarily uh, the best option. Gaza, for example, in one of the evacuations of the Israeli settlements was an interesting case because, you know, some of these rubbles, in fact, is still there. So not always the destructions will also mean getting rid of the regime of colonization because Gaza is still under colonization, you know? So, um, and therefore the other somehow approach was also to think, um, you know, just to reuse it. So, you know, there is no big problem. This is colonial architecture. You know, before it was school, we continue to use a school and municipality, etc. But I want just to refer on this um, debate, you know, between Nero and Grandi, where actually uh, Nero was thinking that, you know, Indian colonial, uh, British colonial architecture could be just reused by the new independent India. That was enough. A new regime, you know, can just reuse. But of course, Gandhi knew very well that if you actually don't change the very nature and the very function of this colonial architecture, in a way, coloniality is what is still there, despite the fact that the regime actually is changing. And these are, of course, all the, if you like, you know, the, the feats of, of the historical decolonizations, which somehow colonial regime were most of the time were actually replaced by, um, you know, dictatorship and were replaced by, you know, uh, the same violence in a way that was inherent. So the approach that we, um, in a way, explore since the very beginning was a third approach, was calling for the profanation and subversion of this structure. I mean, it's not enough to just reuse them. We have to radically change their structure. We have to radically change their aim. And we have, and that needs to be done collectively, reimagining the function. So not only um, reusing them, uh, you know, as, as they are. So some, the, our project, in a way, were always a kind of declination of, of that sort of understanding, and especially, as I said, in architecture being somehow the uh, material manifestations of certain kind of uh, ideology. Um, since also we, I, I jump because I, of course, we don't have enough time, but since also more recently, we moved back to, to Europe, and as I said, decolonization it is a practice and therefore it can only be situated in a specific context. So for us, of course, continue working in Palestine is, is definitely important, but also at the same time, our, if you like, frontline change in the moment which we now are, um, are in Europe. And the frontline we believe in understanding for us decolonization has to do especially with knowledge production, has to do especially with the, for example, the role that I personally have inside um, uh, and, and, uh, and educational institutions is actually to challenge, to, to, to challenge the very um, colonial understanding and epistemologies that are at the base of how, you know, we, especially European, are projecting the reality. And, and unfortunately, that is still a kind of dominant understanding. Of course, when I say, you know, this, um, in, in a sense, you know, you can be very colonial and being situated outside of Europe. So also it's important that we don't fixate only with territories and, and identity because of course it's, it's way more complicated than that. And in fact, I have to say that one of the maybe big change that also participates in what we saw in the last weeks was also the bodies, you know, the non-Western bodies are today inside the metropolis that actually are challenging from inside and therefore the colonization from inside become even more relevant today than actually how it was historically, I think it was mainly outside of Europe because you know we also hear many people say, but that's it's, no, it's their problem. No, it, the problem is actually inside the Western society and, and these are actually the, the big work needs to be done inside the Western society is the work of decolonization. And this is also very important to say how not to get stuck you know, in, in, in identity politics because each one of us has to find her own and his own role in this common struggle. You know, it doesn't mean, of course, one has to substitute his own identity, but somehow for us was also, and especially for me, as someone is born in the south of Italy, understanding also my own locations 
as a way the south of Italy was understood as an internal colonization of Italy. And, uh, and of course, we don't have enough time here to say, but just would like to, to mention how important it was for me via Said, via Palestine, understanding that the south of Italy was actually in fact treated as, 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 a, as an internal colony. The southern Italian were always you know, understood and, and the, and the uh, southern questions was always a problem that Gramsci wrote about. And of course here, there is this incredible uh, possibility of connecting this different you know, um, way of thinking across geography that somehow are not bounded anymore, as Sandy was mentioning, what, what colonialism wants to do, wants to separate us. That is also very important to say that I do hope that we can cultivate as a, an understanding of decolonization that actually is able to reconnect rather than simply uh, separate us because you know otherwise we just play in the hands of of the ones that once somehow control us so uh in this just first round i i just want to trace therefore our personal understanding and i think i want to restate that i do hope that we don't fall into the trap of trying to find you know a way a perfect way to define decolonization asking the question is actually very important but each one of us individually and collective has to answer in a very specific and situated way for us as i said it remains palestine and the struggle of decolonization in palestine is to get rid of israel colonization occupation and apartheid is absolutely key in europe for our perspective is decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing knowledge productions. And this is where universities actually are the epicenter of the work that needs to be done. Because if we don't challenge the frame that still exists, that understand the other, you know, understand and, and continue to perpetuate a certain kind of colonial perspective, this is the work that actually each one of us working, staying as the students or also as a teaching staff inside university, this is actually a very important role. So it's not simply, this is something that the others have to do. No, if you are inside an, an, an institution, especially in educational institutions, that is the work that needs to be done. That is a work to reframe and reframing is very, very important because otherwise we are constantly asked, and you see that through the media, the media constantly ask the same questions. You know, it's not about talking about, you know, decades of, of apartheid colonization occupations. They only talk about the recent events, which usually, you know, one rocket that Hamas, you know, will, will, will send. And I think that is the challenge we have to, 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 to do, is to reframe these questions and asking different questions and oppose any reduction. This is the colonial gaze. This is the colonial frame that I, I believe the, we have to change. And this is something that I think tonight, maybe we can, you know, participate to that and do that from inside, not thinking that the struggle is, is out there. No, the struggle is out here. And thank God, you know, that so many people fight over decades or over centuries. And we reach to that point in which this is not a problem out there. It is a problem inside Western societies. Thank you, Sandy and Alessandra. This is this is really powerful, and I think this is a great way to start today's conversation. It is indeed um, the issue and the question of decolonization has indeed um, manifested now here in North America and Europe in a much more stronger way. And, and and I'm really happy that we are able to actually even talk about it and discuss such topics. I feel like. Um, uh, a couple of years before, it would have been much harder to host events like those, and and I'm, and and it's it's really thank God to all the different, um, all the different groups and people, and really all those who preceded us, um, that really kind of helped open up the way for us to be able to have conversations like this. So thank you, really, Alessandro and Sandy, for for this beautiful beginning. Um, I'll 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 give the mic now for Abbott to talk about his. Uh, research and his look at resistance uh, in Palestine, um, and then we'll go back to having a dialogue and a discussion between the all four of us. Go ahead, Abed. Oh, really? I have to talk about the PhD. <laughs> okay. It's Rana. up to you. You can talk about something else. <laughs> yeah. It's very complicated to narrow down my my research, but anyway, I'm very happy to to share uh, with you some of my fresh knowledge that I already kind of produced in my uh, doctoral research. So basically I start from uh, my personal experience. I was born in the city of Nablus, which is for generations, it was a seedbed for uh, many Palestinian revolutions. 
So since my childhood, the revolution was always there in, in, in the city where I lived. So Israeli soldiers were always there. Different types of resistance were already there. And then I went to um, uh, architecture school at Gazette University, where I started to, uh, to, to understand more about this ty these types of resistance. And then it came to my mind that most of our practices of resistance, whether it was uh, um, uh, disobedience or uh, strike or um, um, art resistance, most of them are actually, most of them have um, um, so special dimensions. And uh, I studied more about it, and then I really realized that um, uh, architecture and urban planning are really in the core of our struggle. Then after some more interest in this topic, I, um, I started to say, yes, um, as architect and planner, I have to, to study more the relationship between these two opposing projects. So I started to define that we have, from the very beginning, we have very two opposing projects, the Zionist colonial project that aimed at establishing a Jewish state on the land of Palestine. And since the late Ottomans, we also have a Palestinian or a national project to liberate ourselves from any, um, oppo any oppressive system, whether it was Ottoman or um, uh, British or Israeli or whatever. So there is, since more than 100 years, there is two opposing projects a settler colonial project, the Zionist project that became Israel, and a Palestinian liberation project that is still ongoing until now. And in my doctoral research, all my focus was about what is the role of architecture and urbanism and urban planning in these two opposing projects, and how these two opposing projects appropriated or used architecture urban planning, urbanism, and special dimensions in their tactics and strategies. And it was astonishing. So actually, I can, I can claim after I have done my research that architecture and um, urbanism is uh, a signifier in, in, in our struggle or in the Palestinian struggle. So most of the research that I have read about um, the, the special dimension of uh, confrontation between these two projects is mainly talking about um, the colonial system, the oppressive system. It's analyzing how Israelis, how British were trying to control the population, were trying to control the Palestinian uh, liberation movements and to, oppose, to, 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 to impose a controlling system that controls all types of all aspects of everydayness in the Palestinian land. However, um, the, the, the analysis of Palestinian special practices on uh, confronting, the, confronting, confronting this, the, these colonial projects is normally undermined. So in 2010, I decided to, to go more into these to my research. And in 2013, I started my doctoral research in Leuven. And my focus was about studying the, the special dimension of, of Palestinian resistance. And I didn't call it resistance because for me, resistance in the land of Palestine has different types of uh, activities, as I have mentioned before, but we as Palestinians, we prefer to use a term that is called sumud. And sumud sometimes means steadfastness, sometimes it means uh, active resistance, sometimes it means disobedience. So, in, and in general, there were different types of resistance. Some of them were passive, it's just about staying alive. Sometimes they were just neutral because we have no other option. And sometimes they were active or just like the armed resistance or the liberation movement that was established in, in the 60s. So um, I started to study and then I started to narrow down my investigations into seeing how this was manifested in the space. And at the end, I don't want to go into the long story. I started to, to analyze how Palestinians in the city of Nablus, could appropriate their spaces during the invasion, during the Israeli uh, invasion of the city. So while the Israelis are invading the city and while there is a, a very harsh combat, the armed combat between Palestinians and the Israeli army, how civilians appropriate their places and how they stay alive, how they resist, how they play, how they maintain their everydayness. And then I narrowed down my investigation again into the Kasbah of Nablus because studying the whole area of Nablus with its different um, special tissues, it became um, um, 
more time demanding. So I decided to focus on the old town of Nablus, the Caspa, which is almost the, the existing uh, old town of Nablus is 2000 years old. But of course, the, the old town of Nablus is almost 6000 years old. So uh, I started to study the old town of Nablus, how people appropriated their spaces and how they managed to live during the invasion. Of course, E.L. Wiseman has produced an intensive study about how Israelis invaded the old city of Nablus through walking through walls. And he tried to map some of these activities. And I started my research almost from where he ended. So I started my research from, okay, the Israelis invaded from this approach. So what Palestinians have experienced while Israelis, Israelis were invading. And then I started to analyze uh, the, the, uh, the, the special practices of people and how they managed to do their everydayness. And then I started, to, I started to study how the space hindered or facilitated these practices. So I wanted to have an idea how architecture can support or uh, hinder the practices of Palestinians during the Israeli invasion or during war. Of course, it can be, uh, this study can be uh, also imagined and maybe studied for other cases. At the end, uh, there, are, there were many conclusions about um, my research. And uh, I think um, if, if the time allows, I will explain to you, but in general, I, I analyzed the city in three dimensional models and I studied the morphology like no one has done before. I, it was it was really very intensive and exhausting analysis. And for security reasons, because I wanted to show how people practice their resistance in the space. So for security reasons, I can't show this on maps. I can't show this on illustrations because uh, war is not done yet. So we still have, or we think that we will still have uh, some more episodes of con uh, confrontation on the city of Nablus. So to to show and analyze my stories or the survival stories or the resistance stories, I had to invent a new city. And uh, this new city I called it Cham and it is based on the grammars and the words and syntaxes of the city of Nablus, the Caspa of Nablus. And I have um, uh, showed most of my um, analysis on, um, on 3D models. But then of course, and I can't show them on a thesis on 3D models, I, 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 analyze, I produced some um, stories, six survival stories. If you allow me, maybe I can show you quickly uh, these um, stories. Yes, please, Abed, I, I already gave you a share screening. Because actually I, um, I forgot <laughs> most of, uh, okay. You know, I, I was I had um, a design studio today for six hours, so you can imagine my mind now. <laughs> I'm sorry that the event is quite late as well in Palestine. Yeah, so, no <laughs> so in my thesis, there were uh, three, uh, six final stories out of fifty stories that I analyzed in in, in my the doctoral journey. There, I summarized them into six main stories, and these stories are. Um, can you see the screen now? So it's the three shelters. I talk about three shelters. Another story, it's, it's curfew, let's play. And the third one is the collective kitchen. The fourth is homing the neighborhood. And the fifth is the, the window to a new life. And finally, the risk to path. And of course, all of these stories explain some of many other stories that has happened. And um, I'm not sure if you see the whole screen, but in general, to show the stories on a thesis, I have to make a kind of, um, um, uh, to divide my, my findings or my description into, uh, um, to, to introduce the characters that, I, that, that actually acted in this story. So these are people of the city. So I, I didn't talk about persons, I talked about characters. And then I talked about the stage. Uh, so analyzing the space where uh, the activities has, has done, uh, have done. And then the storyboard, which is explaining the, by, uh, through some scenes, the activities of resistance. So in the six, in, in, the, in the three shelter story, um, I, I showed how people could appropriate different types of uh, improvised shelters and uh, how derelict spaces 
um, actually were of great importance in this, um, this uh, um, practice. And uh, actually, I tried to show how social network inside the Caspa worked immensely to rescue a complete family from being uh, bulldozed by the Israeli bulldozer. And this type of images is what I show. And normally in, in, in the thesis, you will find uh, two pages on, on, um, on, on the same page. You will find two illustrations. One illustration is this one showing what happened during the conflict or during the battle. And the other is showing how the space is used in everyday time. So it is without having this clashes, how people are using these spaces. So then we can see what changes between the, the regular everyday and the um, uh, combat zone. And in the other story, the it's careful, let's play. It's, it was intentionally to show that the time of exception or the time of war is also for us sometimes, is the time for playing, for socializing, for maintaining a kind of um, unity in, in, uh, during the conflict. And sometimes even um, behind or beside or above or below the Israeli army. And uh, so the collective kitchen, it was a very important story as well. So this is, of course, the, the, the screen, the, the shot that you are seeing now, it's part of Sham city, it's the invented city. It's not the city of Nablus, but it is simulating the same spaces where the stories has happened. And of course, like in this one, this map, this in, in red, it is the, the color in red, it's the Israeli army invading. In, in, in um, blue, it is the Palestinian civilians. And it, this, uh, the, the Israeli army are invading from house to house through these networks. And here in this story, I focused on how Palestinian resistance uh, interact with the Palestinian civilians. And the collective kitchen is an important story about how people appropriate spaces to make collective dinners and collective food for the whole neighborhood sometimes, and sometimes for more than one neighborhood. And indeed, in all of these stories, I also showed uh, the importance of very fine details of uh, the architectural composition. So in homing the neighborhood, I showed that what we believe as a home in the old town um, during the war expands or shrinks, but mostly it expands to the all spaces that are safe, that are not inv invaded by the Israeli army. And normally for the specificity of the old town, women gain the, 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 the power to reorganize these spaces between different neighborhoods or between different uh, um, uh, clusters. And the architecture of the Caspa allowed um, a high level of fluidity of making connections between the what I call the safe neighborhoods or safe clusters. Sometimes one room is safe, the other rooms are not safe, but this safe room becomes part of the safe cluster. So, and here the window to a new life, it is about a window that was in a neglected space. It was a derelict room but it was um, the only way where the family could escape and, um, um, and manage to maintain their life without this window that is broken and in a derelict space, without the window, the, the family would have been killed through uh, some bombs. And the, the rescue path is about how Palestinians appropriated uh, different rescue paths in between houses and in between places to avoid the lines of abuse or the lines of fire of the Israeli army. And of course, uh, it, some important um, um, conclusions that the city uh, for the people living in it becomes to be identified in dif different, um, um, different ways. So we understand, or we were taught in the architectural school that we understand the city as Lynch has described it, nodes and um, paths and edges and landmarks and so on. But for me, I think, and during the war, the city becomes composed of receptacles, which, is, which are strategic structures that meet urgent needs, and sneaks, which are alternative routes of movements that are concealed from the Israeli, Israeli fields of fire or fields of view. And these sneaks are composed of sometimes invisible sides of the street, but also direct houses, back doors, um, undergrounds, and so on. And also the edges, the edges now are different. So the edges are three-dimensional imagined lines that separate exposed and protected spaces. Imagine because they imagine the space according to where Israelis and Palestinians are existed. 
So for example, in this story, this, line, this red line is the edge, which is the street. So instead of being the path, now it is the edge where people can move. And also spaces of marginality because this old town is very um, neglected. So um, these spaces that are drilling became very important during the battle. So they became, um, the, they became crucial to maintain the living during the life. And, uh, and my third conclusion may be, um, sorry, that the workability of the matrix of resilience or that I call the matrix of smooth is based also on the, the integration or the, um, the relationship between the lifting of a lot of social conventions that are related to the space that is also facilitated by, facilitated by a thick social network. So the thick social network works on the lifting of social conventions to the space. And that's why we can appropriate sneaks. And um, finally, maybe I will talk about that. What is my main conclusion is that uh, the architecture and um, the, the urban tissue is an open signifier because it allowed in the city of Nablus and the Caspar, it allowed two matrices to, 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 to fight at the same space, sometimes even at the same house, sometimes even at the same um, staircase. The matrix of control, uh, from my analysis that I accomplished after where uh, E.L. Wiseman has stopped, it is composed of launcher outposts, worms, and controlling houses that is normally chasing after the, 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 arm, the, um, the elements of matrix of small, which are receptacles, sneaks, and edges. So in general, these are my, my uh, findings in, um, in, uh, in my research. And I think the way I try to understand architecture is really enlightening me how to understand how can we prepare our city for different types of violence in the future. And how can citizens in different other cities can appropriate their spaces in the future? So I'm, I'm mostly part of, I'm not talking about as an urbanist now because normally urbanists work for the state, but I, I prefer to work as a, a citizen who considers urbanism as also part of the, the, the residents or the civilians resistance. So- Actually, but this is a perfect point. point if you don't mind. Uh, for me to jump in and open the conversation between you and Sandy and Alessandro, because I, this is a this is a moment where I'm actually cu quite curious about. We talk about decolonization and we talk about resistance, and we all agree that um, the colonial powers have used architecture and urban planning for their for their gain to be able to kind of control the land. Is there a way to actually employ architecture in the same way so that we build and we design as a moment of resistance and decolonization? Or is decolonization and resistance kind of an after effect after uh, architecture or colonial architecture has been built, if that makes sense? Sandy, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that it's, it's for me a, a very important point, again, to come back to, to the way we frame architecture, right? I mean, in, in that sense, is it, is it architecture that comes in a tabula rasa where the architects are the ones building or it's our role also to sort of begin to understand architecture from other gazes, right? And in, in that sense, for example, uh, practicing architecture in Palestine, I would say that statelessness as a way of life and where people are depending on themselves and not on the state became a very important condition to understand uh, uh, architecture. And indeed, when we wrote Permanent Temporariness, it was about how you would bring inside architecture thoughts of temporariness as a very important condition of thinking architecture. Because the, the, the issue is that as architects, we have been trained always that what we have to aim for is permanency. Indeed, I think that architects are colonizers by definition, right? I mean, in, in that sense, the, our maximum desire is to take an empty land and colonize it and to show how good we are into producing the best piece of architecture, right? And I think that we should absolutely begin to struggle with, uh, with this discipline as, as and with, with all the matrix 
of colonialism that our discipline carry and begin to understand how we are involved in what actually is built around us in the cities and which condition they are building through, right? And in, in that sense, from a place like Palestine, definitely conditions such as statelessness and domesticity become a very important point of rethinking architecture and, and rethinking the power of architecture and, and how as architects we can employ our knowledge into opening up not to create you know the best library or the best church or that that would last uh, uh, ages be, uh, uh, after us but how we will be humble enough also to understand permanent temporariness and sometimes temporariness as even more essential uh, 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 ways of understanding architecture and engage with, with it beyond the authorship of the architect. I think this becomes a very important way of thinking architecture and decolonization, right? I, I, I believe yeah. and believe that the frame is very, very important and from which we are thinking, from the, the gazes from which we are thinking architecture becomes crucial to understand what kind of architecture we can build and not only we can react to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I appreciate when um, Alessandro said that decolonization is kind of a, it's a process, it's, it's an event rather than a moment. And I think Abed, um, your research is quite strong in that, in that sense where when you look at resistance, it's not really um, one action or one day, but it's really this series of events that are also a social event rather than just kind of a, a, a something that's built, right? So it's really the people and how they manipulate space. That's really what's important. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Abed, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. So yes, as um, I think as architects and planners who were taught in the modern academia, actually we are very far away from the kind of um, um, urban planning and um, uh, architecture that, that is the army think about. And I think there is a very important point here that architecture, uh, sorry, that resistance is uh, by nature is tactical while urban planning is strategic. And architecture uh, resistance by nature is uh, uh, temporary and changing, while what we plan and what we build is supposed to be permanent or at least for um, many years. And actually a resistance by, by, by nature is based on reactions and adaptation, while in architecture we are not trained to do this and architecture should be resilient and should be always available. So in, 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 in the core of resistance and in the core of the core of architecture, they don't mix actually. The Israeli army tried to mix them by, you know, um, Aviv Kukhavi, who was interviewed by Ian Wiseman. And by the way, Aviv Kukhavi um, is now the chief of staff for the Israeli army. And he's the, the head of the, this new attack against Gaza. And he was the mastermind behind the invasion of the old town of Nablus. And he said, okay, we have to, re, re, to, to reverse uh, engineer the city, reverse engineering the city to understand it in different way. So he he established his own understanding of the architecture, and he says that they train uh, the Israeli soldiers to be uh, architects in operation. And this is a new understanding of architecture, but it is based on power. Okay, this cannot happen with resistance because resistance play with what exists and actually it resists according to what the, the space allows. But what is new now in the Palestinian discourse is the resistance in Gaza, for example, they started to, to, to understand the space almost like army. And so that's why re, they, they replaced the overground with the underground. So there is a complete city underground of uh, Gaza or what they say that the Metro Hamas now and this actually replaces or places, negotiates the power of the army to neglect the architecture of the uh, Gaza Strip. So the army neglects the existence of, of architecture and neglects the power of architecture. And because uh, the Palestinian is reacting to this neglection of architecture, they, they infin, invented their own architecture, which is strategic by the way. So the, the, the tunnels, network in Gaza is strategic project for the resistance there. So, and this is the first time I think that I'm in, in the Palestinian um, resistance against the colonial system where resistance uh, employ architecture or employ 
I don't know if this is architecture, it's hollowed space, employ the space as a tool of resistance which yeah. may also invite us to think how architecture can be part of the resistant thinking for at least medium um, medium uh, level. So not only not necessarily for a long time, but maybe for a I short do. time. Yeah. And it can be in between tactical and strategic. Yeah, yeah. that's that's very nice. Thank you, Abed. I, I have a couple more questions that I would love to open the conversation with. Uh, but while we do that, if anyone's interested in asking questions, uh, please feel free to type them down. Uh, so we're also aware of the amount of questions that are um, that are going to be asked. So we are aware of time. Uh, in the meantime, um, my next point that I would like to talk about um, is, is this question of how this concept of resistance and decolonization have now been brought into academia. So we all know that we've all been involved in teaching. Abed, you're currently teaching at Birzeit University. Alessandro, you're currently teaching um, the Decolonizing Architecture Advanced Studies at the Royal Institute um, uh, of Art in Stockholm. And you're also involved with Sandy in campus and camps. Uh, in the history. So really, in a way, teaching in different ways and different forms have always been in part of your practice. And I'm curious to see um, how questions of colonization, resistance, and decolonization are typically addressed in those academic contexts. And if you feel that there are any limitations to the way that they're taught, or if there's ways to kind of expand upon those. So, Ali, um, Ali, Alessandro, would you like to start? Yes, I can, I can try. Um, and maybe I thought that might be also good just to uh, also to, to try to, to clarify maybe also the, you know, the words that we use um, and, and, and the way in which I, uh, I understand them. And maybe it's a, it's like a little bit an open question for, uh, for everyone. Um, because I'm not sure that resistance and decolonization are somehow synonymous, uh, yeah. and and resistance, the um, let's say it also operates uh, and imply the resistance to a power. So in some way, also despite you know it's of course a very important act, but we also know that it's not enough. It's not enough because in a way, especially through our critical analysis. I think we are trapped into the reaffirmations of the power. You know, we are trapped in the logic of the colonizer, no? Because at the best, uh, we can, of course, craft, you know, a fantastic critique, but we are stuck in critical studies. We are stuck, you know, in, into the fact that, you know, we look at the Israeli as this machine, you know, they do the military, and at the best, we can mirror that. So for me, decolonization is the emancipation from this, is emancipation from that discourse, is, is a way that you at some point just change, you know, perspective. You look into completely something else. Um, and that for me is, is the first maybe important thing that needs to happen. And back to the question, you know, how we do that in the academia, because, you know, sometimes they, there are very also there important um, initiatives, you know, and I, you know, by saying this, I don't want to dismiss, you know, any attempts that people, you know, is now there are so many groups and trying to do different things. But I always find difficult, you know, to think that, you know, you can decolonize the curriculum. Um, I think the curriculum needs to be abolished. I mean, the curriculum is the problem. You know, that is, for me, also the kind of, you know, explanation why I think decolonization has to just to be, you know, it, it, it's it's a liberating moment. You know, it's a liberating which you don't even talk about your enemy anymore because you are way beyond. You know, you include it, then you move on. And I think that, you know, if we talk, for example, in the academia also about decolonizing curriculum, you know, we are back to to the same problem. I don't think, you know, that university and the curriculum can be reformed or can even be decolonized. I don't think absolutely. But this doesn't mean that actually we can have and we have to do we have to introduce decolonial practices within these places you know by can be inside university or can be outside it doesn't matter these maybe as abed was saying are also maybe you know tactical things you know in a fight i can decide sometimes i can be in sometimes i can be out it doesn't matter i don't want to get stuck there i don't want to have a discussions about institutional critique or not you know i don't care I, what I do care is what you do if you are inside university. This is where I want I want to be judged, and I want to judge people. 
if they're outside, I'll do the same. So I don't buy, you know, that if you do decolonizing the curriculum, you know, you are in a safe space, or if you are an activist outside university, you know, you are in a safe space. No, you have to judge on your practice. You have to judge on how what you do, you know, is tied into a, a, a struggle for, for liberations and not, you know, into the kind of more, um, yeah, in, in relation to, to, to pre-constituted frames. Yes, I, I, I think, I think I think I think that that attitude in terms of kind of switching gears and looking at something completely different it's it's quite important because as long as you are within the framework of the colonial structure it's it's really it's impossible to leave and I think that's why when you alluded as well to Fanon in the beginning Alessandro this idea that decolonization is a full rupture from the colonized from the colonizer as well is in a way important whether it's violent or not but I think it's the rupture the break from the colonizer that's quite important um I, I feel like in the Palestinian context though be, if we talk about built space and we talk about working within Palestine it becomes still quite hard because the the colonizer is still kind of exists and it, and his powers are quite strong and they're fluctuating and changing on a daily basis. Um, so maybe my, my next question would be um, the question in terms of how do our actions in decolonization, whether within Palestine or as, as voices around the world, how they can they deal with this constant shift and constant flux that's happening within the colonial powers? I mean, I, I, I believe and, and feel that one, one way of, of understanding our um, way of operating is how we create alliances, right? And, and what does it mean to create uh, alliances with, and, and when I speak about alliances, I, I speak about the idea of, of creating uh, or, or how we break our isolations, right? Because it has been since a while that there has been a lot of individuals attempts on how to, and indeed what I suffer the most all the time when the whole idea is how uh, these practices are from that place and everybody wants to check your authenticity, right? Or how much Palestinian you are, how much you are able to speak Arabic, how, I mean, I, I am sometimes asked so many questions to check my uh, authenticity that I find that we are exactly doing what colonialism wants us to do, right? I mean, they separate us and we are there to check on each other, each other's authenticities. And I think that if we begin to want to, uh, frame, other frames rather than the colonial frame, we should get a little bit out and understand alliances beyond this. You know, I, I speak about myself, you know, working with Alessandro has been for me and we come from a two different colonial uh, uh, backgrounds, right? I, I have been uh, living in Palestine for long and, and being exposed to the Israeli physical uh, occupation and, and Alessandro has, has been coming out of, of a, a, you know, a, a fascist colonial Italian uh, sort of background while without realizing that Italy itself is still exercising within Italy a lot of color, internal colonialism, right? Coming together and permitting each other to create certain kind of alliances open up for me and for him and, and for other people with whom we work, you know, we worked also with Eyal Weizmann establishing that at the beginning, but we opened it up for many other residents and people to say, how can we actually support each other to uh, break these frames? Because, you know, breaking the frame is the first act of decolonization. Decoloni we are not aware of how many how, how much we are colonizing our own minds. And for me to decolonize our minds alone would have been an impossibility, right? I mean, to decolonize our minds, we need to feel strong enough, empowered enough, and we need to understand each other different perspectives. And we need to get into this struggle, understanding and positioning ourselves as 
people that are in the process of decolonization, no matter what is your identity, the moment that you decide to go into this path, this path means that you decide to abandon the colonial sort of framework and to go somewhere else. And all what you would need people around you that are doing the same, right? So to come back and to question each other identities and to tick the boxes for me begins now, it, it, it seems very clear as a way to react to colonialism and still be within operating within inside the colonial uh, framework. So how can we get out, create alliances and build actually trans, transdisciplinary, transnationally, uh, trans struggle and whatever we want to call it and, and help each other way and more understand and if we are in this moment of optimism for palestine it is exactly because it's managing to break certain colonial framework so i think that we should proceed in in there it, it's we begin a street and we should be strong enough not to come back to our colonial gazes that's great thank you sandy um i have uh, multiple more questions and things that I would like to talk to you about, uh, but I see that there are some questions that the audience would like to ask. So I'll open it up for the audience uh, uh, for now, and then if we have more time, hopefully we can continue our conversation. Uh, I see there's a question from Anwar Jabir. Anwar, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Rena, and thank you for the uh, for the wonderful speakers. I will actually go up to the very first sentence that um, Sandy said that uh, when they were invited to their uh, Venice Biennale, I think in 2003 or 2006, they refused to build something because Palestine was not a, a state. Um, in the light of that, and in the light of our discussion on architecture as being permanent, how do you see the current ongoing construction that is taking place in Palestine? In other words, um, there is this attitude that, you know what, we're not going to build, we're going to wait until liberation, or we're going to deal with this architecture. But on the other hand, there's this very popular motto in Palestine that, you know what, no, we resist and therefore we build. We are building our Palestinian state. And in that, I would mention what, what the current government is doing with their um, um, a state project, state building project and the ongoing construction there. Uh, but what other regular people are doing actually and saying, you know what, we're building our Palestine and it's very important that we build. So in this question, how, how do you see that in the light of your own perspective of we don't build because we're not a state uh, and in the light of, um, of resistance? Could, can we consider that as a form of resistance actually? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I can answer this, when we say we refuse to build, we refuse to build in a very, very specific condition in Venice Biennale where the attempt was represent Palestine for the world, right? And we did not accept to be part of this uh, game of representation, right? I mean, it was enough for them that we built a Palestinian pavilion and people will celebrate the Palestinian state. And that's it, right? Rather than to take this occasion and say, where are all the stateless people that are not represented in this place? This is a complete different discourse towards Palestine. And I, I still believe, I mean, I, we are among the ones that says we should not only build Palestine, we should today think about you know, rights, gender rights. I mean, in, in Palestine, we tend all the time to say, let's postpone everything until the liberation. Now we speak about uh, women's rights, no, maybe it's better. Now we have the main important thing of liberating Palestine, let's wait until uh, it's over. And, and we believe that it's in the contrary, more we build, today of Palestine, this is what our struggle is about. What kind of Palestine we imagine, right? I mean, what kind of Palestine we not only imagine, but we are able to build and to share with others and to be able to prove on the ground that this is uh, 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 at all possible. And this is where we, I say our practice change shifted completely when we were working 
in the West before and before we moved to Palestine in 2006, and then we arrived to Palestine. And now that we return back, actually, it, it has been shifted even more because if at the beginning we were speaking to the West in Palestine, we were understanding what kind of practice of decolonization we can be doing. Now what we actually are able to do, which was a little bit of, of we were not sure that we can really make it and it makes us feel even more empowered that we are in this moment doing this is that how you learn from palestine and from struggle of liberation in palestine and you bring it back to the uh, uh to the to the colonies sort of speak to the to the inside the frame through which you will open cracks and you by you would bypass this frame so i think that these are three different moments of our practice that are very much different one of the other, but that they all were trying to understand how can we position ourselves towards what we believe the colonization should be. And, and definitely, I would say that our practice changed uh, uh, radically depending on where are the places where we are uh, operating. Thank you, Sandy. Um, we also have a hand raised from Dr. Samar in Nazet from Birzeit University. Dr. Samar, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Mm, um, hello, how are you, everybody? Thank you, Alessandro and uh, Sandy and David for your uh, talk about this thing. And uh, what I would like to just make uh, uh, some kind of uh, comment about uh, curriculums in the universities. I think also Alessandro said that uh, there's a problem in the curriculums, but I think uh, as um, professors and uh, instructors for students, we can manipulate the curriculum uh, to uh, work in a way um, uh, that uh, um, make students uh, aware of uh, what is going on uh, from this uh, occupation in Palestine and the colonization uh, of the whole Palestine. And really in Birzeit University, we are uh, uh, doing lots of things uh, in spite of what is uh, in the curriculum, because for example, uh, we use a sort of uh, each year um, a kind of theme for the year. For example, uh, one uh, time we uh, asked most uh, the whole uh, instructors and professors uh, to concentrate on resilience architecture, uh, once about uh, decolonization, once about uh, military landscape in the courses of landscape and urban planning and so on. Uh, so this is a um, yeah, sort of uh, uh, always uh, has been done in at least in the year University, and I am sure in other universities this uh, 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 also done. Um, uh, again, also we uh, concentrate on conservation of our uh, heritage, uh, which is also a kind of uh, resistance uh, of the occupation. Um, and uh, maybe lots of you know about the competition uh, that is um, made by um, uh, Palestine Land Society, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Salman Abu Sitte, and um, all the universities in Palestine, Al uh, Najah uh, University, Birzeit, Al Quds, uh, Polytechnic, uh, Gaza, Al Islamic University, all the since five years they are sharing uh, with this competition, which is uh, for uh, a reconstruction and revitalization of the uh, destroyed villages uh, in Palestine. Uh, so always we are aware of uh, uh, decolonizing, uh, aware of 
uh, return to uh, whole Palestine. And I think uh, most of the uh, instructors and professors do this in their um, uh, academic uh, career for the students. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank yeah. you again. Thank you, Dr. Summer. I think uh, being a Birzeit graduate myself and as well uh, teaching at Birzeit for, for a couple of years, I appreciate this new trajectory that the university has taken where there is much more awareness on being, being, uh, being uh, really um, focused and, and really understanding the colonial powers and as well how they manipulate space. So I, I, I'm really happy to see that the Birzeit University is taking that uh, uh, kind of uh, trajectory. And I know Abed is also doing that in his work at Birzeit. Uh, would you like to say something, Abed? Yeah, actually, the problem is not with the curriculum and can show, uh, it is actually with the curriculum, but the problem with the curriculum is also because the state of art about this topic is still immature. It's still not developed, not very well developed. I, in my research, I had to, to go to the field from, from month zero because there is no literature that is really talking about these things. And on the other hand, there is no practice. Of course, there is a lot of practice, but it's not disseminated. It's not studied. It's not really um, developed into a curriculum. So um, we try in Birzeit University, and I'm aware about other places, uh, to, to rethink about architecture as a tool of resistance or as a tool of resilience, uh, not only against the, um, the environmental issues, but also against the state power and against, the, against terrorism, for example. So architecture should be involved. And I remember here once, when I started my doctoral research, I did my first presentation for my research group in, in Leuven. And the first, the very first question I received is, shall we really study these things? <laughs> so the first question was, why? Why should we study this type of things? Uh, there is no need because we always think of the city as the site of progress, as the site of development, but we don't consider the, the crisis or trauma or even the war, which is really part of many, many, um, uh, metropolises and many other places, many other cities in the world. So the, the state of art is still immature, is still not very well developed. The practice is still done by people who are disadvantaged, so they don't disseminate well normally. Even the, the Vietnamese um, experience is not very well disseminated. And actually, the will to do such things, it needs um, a, a kind of um, determination. So because especially in spaces like Palestine, this is still dangerous, okay? So you can, for example, in my research, I cannot de disclose everything, okay? So I disclosed a part of my research. And of course, I just, um, I, I deleted everything that uh, reminds me of real stories, okay? I deleted many things from my laptop because I don't want to remember them, okay? So in, it's not really easy to talk about everything. But of course, what I've used in my research, which is also a problem um, that many people were always um, um, asking me about, is how can we reveal such knowledge? I will tell you that um, Israeli army is training by the time, all the time, about invading cities. And there is two types of knowledge that armies not only armies, that people need to, to, to have in order to practice their activities in the city. So for armies, for anyone, but especially for armies, they need two types of knowledge, Matisse and Tikne, that is described by James Scott. And uh, what I produced is actually Tikne. It is the knowledge that you read, the knowledge that is told to you by someone, which is told by my thesis, it will only be technique. The Matisse cannot be achieved, but by practice. So it's intuitive knowledge. It's only by practicing activities in the very same space. So that's why Palestinian resistance, whether it was in Nablus or in Gaza, they have intuitive knowledge about the space. And that's why they, have, they will always have advantage uh, with, with what relates to the space. The Israeli army always have training, so they improve their intuition toward the city. So this was the thing that I have to, be, to divide when I produce. So I was always curious and, and careful that what I produce can only be technique and um, it cannot be transformed into Matisse. 
And actually, this is why I spent two years of my research just to invent Sham, just to invent a new city. So all the knowledge is just the knowledge that the abstract knowledge that can be used by the armies in their uh, everyday um, teaching courses in their army colleges. Thank you, Abed. I think you actually answered Randa Hazan's question quite beautifully. So um, this, I just was a great, <laughs> <laughs> this was a great way to actually as well answer that question. Uh, we'll end uh, with Claudio Scarby's question. Um, Claudio asks, what can be done in a permanent state of exception if not responding to the emergencies of the provoc provocations of the colonizers? Um, I think this question probably goes as well specifically to Dar and to Alessandro and Sandy. Um, would you like to address that in a way or another? Um, yeah, I guess from working in refugee camps, I think we uh, have learned um, how one could uh, claim you know, that exists and it goes beyond the fact that you just, um, you know, react to the violence and, and you exist, you know, you exist as a Palestinian only because, you know, you are an object on violence. I think, you know, despite all the violence, um, you know, likely enough, you know, people have their own also life and they have their practices and, and they live, you know, beyond the colonial violence. And I would argue even maybe the other way around. Why don't we think that actually um, what comes first is this practice that we call resistance and then the power tend to expropriate the practice, they tend to control people, no? I think it's also this colonial, again, you know, understanding of, of our realities that we call resistance, you know, practices that actually are before and then power follows as a way, you know, to actually control them. And in fact, you know, you can think that the state of exception that the state declare is exactly this, is a way to control the life of the people, you know, and, and therefore the life of the people comes first. So I reverse the question to say that I think we have to understand that there is much more already existing. You know, people are not living just responding to Israeli violence. You know, thank God, Palestinians are incredibly active subject of history. So they are they don't exist only because they react. And that is also the challenge, you know, of all this humanitarianism that, you know, exists. And of course, you are still rely on this. And this actually is the good version of the West because otherwise we get fascism. But of course, we have also to say the limits of that, you know, the limits of that, that at the end of the day, that approach reduce people just to people that react to Israeli violence. And we can only talk about Israel and the massacres and you know nothing else exists. I mean, thank God people have the rest of, of even in time of war, you know, and if you look at Gaza, even under bombardment, you know, and maybe Abed already mentioned this, even when they invade, there is a play. And what is the most beautiful things when you actually you play? Play is the most profane, sacrilegious things. You don't take them seriously even when they come to kill you. And I think that is for me the very interesting agency that comes first. And that is again the work and we need to do to reverse our logic and not to give the Israeli even the right you know, to say that they make Palestinian only as, as, as a kind of um, uh, object of violence at the best, you know, they will just react. No, I think there is the majority of it which is completely unexplored. And that is what I would say, Abed, I mean, that's it and also the, 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 you know, what Birzet could do, there is so much happening that is not theorized in Palestine. That is actually what, it's not, you know, looking at the literature, there is no literature, but actually there is so much, so, so, so much practices. And I think the task of the university actually is to concentrate on that. And I think that is the work that university should do. I mean, not looking for books that already write about it, but actually look at things that already exist and we don't even, you know, have the, the, the names for it. I think that is what is what, what we have to do. Yeah, if I may add, um, Rana. Yeah, go ahead, please, Robert. Yeah, th thank you, Alessandro. Actually, in, um, it, it's not just what I wanted to mention, but literally sometimes we don't respond. It's just we neglect. And neglection sometimes is a type of resistance. So in resistance, that's why I used in my thesis the, the word smooth, 
which is to maintain a certain level of everydayness on the land of Palestine. And sometimes it's an art how to, how to not necessarily to respond, but it is how to maintain your living and to play or even to, to, to travel and come back and to, to study, to establish your life without really having a direct reaction for the uh, provocations by the colonizers. So it's mm -hmm. an art of how to make living. And sometimes it's direct confrontation. Sometimes it's just you turn your back to them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a, a really powerful moment um, and a really good answer from both of you. Um, it's, it's, it's really great to think about how um, really, in a way, survival, really existence is, is, is already the kind of the stem of, of the whole decolonial structure, if you want to say. Really, the, the, the Palestinian voice, whether on in Palestine or outside, is already kind of the, the beginning of the narrative. And I think that's, 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 really, that's really strong. Even saying recently, uh, the actions of Palestinians during the la latest attacks, uh, whether in, uh, whether in uh, Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah, um, in Gaza, how people have been acting uh, with even, as, as Alessandro says, a little bit of play. Where, whenever a, a, a child would be arrested, they would smile for the camera, kind of sending a hint of sarcasm. I think those moments are such powerful moments to as well kind of really question the whole colonial structure, to really kind of disseminate or really, sorry, break up, break down colonial structure, I think those moments by themselves really kind of uh, target target these things quite well. So I, I'm really happy that we've been able to kind of talk about those in, in those ways. I have had many more things that I would like to discuss with you, and I really hope that this would be just the beginning of really wonderful more events that we can have and more discussions that we can have, whether through DWG or whether through different avenues. But this has been really, really great. Um, I don't know if any, if there's any last things you would like to say, Sandy, Alessandro, or Abed. If if that's it, I really want to thank you very much for coming in today. This was really wonderful. And again, for I'm sorry for the start, such a short notice, but. A really great conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the audience as well. And we will be um, recording. This has been recorded and we will be posting it as well on our websites and we'll share it um, with you all once it's posted, if you would like to watch it. Thank you very much for attending today. And uh, thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you Rana, very much. Yeah.